how do you record well, both? Like, does yeah. it miniaturize them? And eh, anyways, so um, just a brief re recap. <laughs> Philippians was written by Paul. He's imprisoned. Remember that. That's that's the main theme of this whole book. Um, watch out for others at the expense of yourself. That was in chapter two. Uh, being blameless isn't about being perfect, but obeying God and not complaining. Um, if you even if you obey God, you will still have struggles. We see that um, really all throughout the book, but also in chapter three. Uh, we can either seek our own glory or God's, but not both. And that's not to say it's wrong to have goals and dreams, or to start a company or a band or a family or anything like that. It's just it's just more like it's wrong to be in, be in it in life to glorify yourself and only yourself. That's 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 what I was trying to say last week. After I afterwards, I was like, man. It kind of sounded like I was telling people not to have hopes or dreams, and that's definitely oh, not what I'm saying, guys. It is so that way to oh, good, good, because you guys absolutely should, you know, have have dreams and have goals, absolutely. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm talking about our glory. We can either have our own glory, or we can have God's glory. So, and then the last thing, anyone can fall away. Even Paul, we saw that in the end of chapter uh, three, I believe. So that takes us to this week. What are your? Uh, no. No! Oh, no! Oh. It deleted it! No! Oh, Guys, no! What? No way! Okay, I had a different question for tonight and it deleted it. Oh, no. See if you can scratch what? it up from your memory. Oh. Control Z, control it's Z. On the, no, it, I can't do that because it's on the flash drive. The flash drive doesn't carry the... Uh, doesn't carry the, the original? The, yeah, oh, it, it just carries... Yeah. Are you sure it's not in recycle bin? Uh, no, because I didn't actually delete it. I, I did. I just changed the name of the other one to this one, and then resaved it like that. No. And it's on the flash drive, and I did all the work on the other thing. Oh, crap. <laughs> okay, well, there's not going to be a question for tonight, okay? Oh, you don't remember what it is? <laughs> no, not even kind of sort of. <laughs> maybe if I was to sit up in the shower crying, rubbing my head, maybe. <laughs> maybe. But as it is right now, no, just no way. Okay. But anyways, uh, so I guess we'll pick up on Philippians 2.16 okay. and hope that the uh, that nothing else is deleted, okay? <laughs> oh, my. <coughs> However, let us keep... backup of a backup. Right. <laughs> However, uh, let us... Where is it? Keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So not don't move forward, but... Continue to live by the st by the standard of righteousness. See, it sounds like what he's saying is, let us keep living by that same standard. Let's let us keep the status quo. But that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying continue to live by the standard of righteousness, rather than with jealousy, envy, fighting, complaining. It's a way of of encouraging the, the audience to continue on in the path towards a good goal, instead of continuing on to the path of a bad goal. Like we're going to see at, here at the beginning of chapter four, for instance, where there's uh, the women who are arguing. So that brings us to the end of that um, that section there, which brings us to that chiasm that I talked about last week. And I wanted to leave it for this week so it didn't take too long. A chiasm, it, it, first off, why is it called a chiasm? Because in Greek, the, the, the Greek letter chi, also pronounced chi, um, is an X. And so you take one half of the X, and it goes like that. You've got a starting point that is the same as the ending point, and then it goes like that where it mirrors each other until you get to the middle point. Okay. So I'll show what I mean, and then you can kind of – so not that I have already obtained it. He says that in, chapter tw in verse 12, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold. So that I may lay hold, right there in, in, in verse 12, lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. And then um, we get to verse 13. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies, lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on, verse 14, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep li uh, living by that same standard to which we have obtained. So if you notice, let me kind of pop this sucker up right here. Um, this point here relates to this point here. Not that I have already obtained it. Let us keep living by that same standard we have obtained. Mm -hmm. Or have already become perfect. Let us therefore as many as are perfect. But I press on. I press on toward the goal. 
So I may lay hold of. I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. So that t that brings us to the idea once again in chiasm. Usually the 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 middle of that the middle point between that between that thing is kind of the main thrust. So if you look, the majority of the down part of the key um, was in verse 12, and then all the other points were stretched out from verses 13 through 16. Okay, so the middle point there is actually found. Um, where is it, right? At the end of verse 12, mm -hmm. for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. The main focus of what he's talking about here is that Christ laid hold of us. <coughs> and then he has this chiasm that builds towards that main climactic point that Christ laid hold of us. Mm. And so in light of all that is this whole thing of him, him pressing on and all that stuff. So what's the main point? The main point is that Paul is saying, obviously I'm not the center of this. God is the center of this. He's the one doing the work. But now that we've established that, that's the key point that I'm trying to make here. Let's still remember that we have to do our work and press forward, okay? Because there's always that tendency for us to kind of slack off, you know, right. move back, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> we like to find places that we're comfortable mm -hmm. and, just, and just kind of coast, coast yeah. like, like like the Israelites living in the wilderness. A pastor brought this up maybe last Sunday, maybe the Sunday before, I don't remember exactly, but um, about how, you know, they had everything, you know, the, no war, they were fed, their clothes didn't wear out, you know, supernatural uh, providing by God, and that was bad, though. And then their kids got the blessing of going and having battle and fighting and having struggles, and that's kind of the thing. We can, as Christians, we can seek this life of just nothing bad ever happens, but as a result, we won't ever get anything either. We won't ever get blessings from God. We won't ever have victories in our life. We'll just coast through life and uh, never really reaching that potential that God made for us. Or we can go into the promised land, so to say, where we are you know, going towards what God has called us for, which involves struggles and it involves having battles and involves pressing on toward God. So not that I press on – not that I uh, have already obtained, but I press on toward the goal. So that takes us to 317. Brethren, join and follow – I'm sorry – did anybody have any questions about that last section? No. The, the chiasm. Right. No. Okay. Remember to stop me if you do. Um, <laughs> since we don't have a discussion question this <laughs> week, uh, I don't want me to dominate the whole thing here. Uh, Brethren, join in following my example and absorb, observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many uh, walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ – whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. So here we have actually a few uh, a few little things. So let's kind of break it down. When we get to verse 19, it's going to be more of a – you'll see how sarcastic Paul can be. Um, verse 17, a brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Whereas others were living poor examples but wanting to have pool in the kingdom, following his example and examples of others like him involved – Giving up that, that, that power struggle, giving up that, that claim to fame, but instead laying it all down, laying their very, his very life down for the cross. And that's what he's saying. Uh, follow this example rather than this example that you're seeing in them. And this is one of Paul's key, um, key points in a lot of his letters is that you can tell that he's a true apostle and that his opponents are not the true apostles by how they live. See, the, the ones who are claiming to be apostles that were not really – you know, not really God's servants. They were in it for money. He mentions that in uh, Second. Second Corinthians. Yes, Second Corinthians. Um, they uh, they even oftentimes opposed the message. Like for instance, here where they have you know this is you you guys need to convert back to Judaism and you know put your faith back in the law rather than in Christ and all this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, <coughs> so verses eighteen through nineteen. For many walk of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping that they that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Um, the Jews and Judaizers, Judaizers thought that they were right. But they were actually making themselves God's enemies by trying to be legalistic. See, they thought by reinforcing the law again after it had already been put away that they were making people more righteous for God. They thought that they were being more faithful than those who just put their faith in Christ. But they were actually making themselves – look at what he says here um, – that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They are literally God's enemies. All that attempt to be perfect by works made them no more than God's enemies. 
That's just a startling realization. They failed to see the point of the law. It was an end in and of itself. They thought that the law was, it was, was created just for them to follow the law. But the law was created for people to put their trust in Christ. So when Christ came, the purpose of the law was fulfilled. Not that we should live as lawless, but the point of it was fulfilled. But they thought that the law was created just for itself. That it was an end. That it was the end in and of itself. That it was the goal, and it was. But it was never the goal. Right. In Romans, he says it was a temporary guide until Christ would come. Mm -hmm. So then, once Christ had come, we could put it away. Now, let me just give a little bit of a caveat. Uh, the law still gives us a foundation for morality. Right. Okay. But we don't have to follow like the sacrifices, for instance. So I hope that that kind of makes sense. And we'll probably look at the law. In the future, how come you know some laws we still think are, are right and wrong, and some laws, some laws we don't think are right and wrong? And we'll look at that some other time. That's the Philippines is not the place to talk about that. Um, but anyways, if you look in verse 19, he says here, "Whose end is destruction? Whose god is their appetite?" Now the word, <laughs> this is really funny, guys. Okay, the word translated appetite it was actually a euphemism for the sex organ. <laughs> What? The peepee. -pee. <laughs> and, so, and so he's saying literally that their God is their Thank circumcision. You. Because the Jews believed in circumcision and they were trying to get people to go back to the law. And so there's th he's saying that by you know thinking that circumcision got them something, <laughs> that they were actually making their circumcision their God, <laughs> which is which is funny. I mean you really have to laugh at how, how Paul said Sometimes writes it's like, like Paul, what are you doing? <laughs> but obviously, um, I won't be teaching that on a Sunday. <laughs> this was what, what happens in Young Adults stays in Young Adults. <laughs> but so it's actually a double play on words. He's talking about their stomach because they have, they believe in the whole dietary restrictions and that stuff. But he's hinting towards towards <coughs> circumcision. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's something. Now some people have gone have now if you notice I have here at the end of the note hedonism or circumcision. Some people have thought that that what he's talking about is actually hedonism, basically uh, overindulgence in the flesh. Mm -hmm. It was a Greek practice. And long story. But anyways, um, but there's nothing in the letter to make us assume that he's talking about um, different Greek philosophies at, at all. Um, all throughout the letters, he's been talking about the Jews and the Judaizers, so it makes more sense to assume that he's talking not about uh, people overeating uh, and indulging in the flesh, but in the dietary restrictions of the law and circumcision. So um, that takes us to – you could observe the dietary restrictions if it hurt your conscience, but not as a means of salvation. Now, Paul actually talks about this in a few of his letters. If you had an issue of conscience where you felt like you were sinning, he said, "That's fine. Go ahead and go ahead and do that." But he made it absolutely clear that it had nothing to do with salvation. Mm -hmm. Our salvation is not by works, so that nobody can boast. It is by faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and he mentions that also uh, with um, eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. Um, but that's a different issue. Um, okay, so in verse it takes us to. There, okay. So in verses 20 to 21, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, who will transform the body of our uh, humble state into conformity with the body of his glory, by the exertion of his power that he has get even to subject all things to himself. So uh, first off, what is he saying here? He's saying, okay, we don't belong to this world. We're waiting for salvation. Um um, from heaven, mm -hmm. who, where, is all, where Jesus is going to come from. Okay, all right. So that's what he's saying here. He's kind of talking about how he's going to transform our bodies. Now, why is he mentioning this? Because he's been talking about how the Jews are putting such stock in their flesh, stock mm -hmm. in their bodies, where they came from. You know, I'm of the tribe of this. Right. I observe the dietary restrictions. I, I'm circumcised on the eighth day. You know, all this stuff. You know, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was, tra I was trained in uh, Galil. You know, all this different stuff that they were taking, putting all this stock in. And now he's saying our citizenship, rather than being putting our stock in the flesh, is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state. Mm -hmm. In other words, we are going to inherit the resurrection of the body, so the circumcision really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. 
<laughs> this thing that they're putting such glory in is not going to matter. Also, it doesn't matter what your bloodline is either. No. Because if we're going to receive the resurrection, that would mean that bloodlines will be done away with. Well, and we're all of one blood anyway. Right. I mean, if you really want to look at it that way, you know, absolutely. We all came from Adam, and then, again, we all right. came through Nat Noah, so it's like... Where's the room for boasting? Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, yes, that's a very good point, mm -hmm. which I actually did not have in my point in my in my notes. So it's a uh -huh. good thing you said that because I was gonna forget it. <laughs> so our focus is on the eternal. We are not Jew or Gentile, but citizens of heaven. Mm -hmm. Citizens of heaven. Now, how funny is it that we were that we were joking about racism uh, before the lesson? I actually forgot that it was gonna work in here. I did not do that on purpose. So you know, we are citizens of heaven. How cool is that? Um, and just a little side note, this is why I'm such a big advocate of women in ministry, um, which if you know me, I, I've talked about this quite a, quite a long time, is because Paul says that we are no longer male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. And so that seems to imply that the room for sexism that was established under Genesis 3.16 was put away with under the revelation – I'm sorry, the um, resurrection – of Jesus mm -hmm. and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Um, but once again, we'll probably talk about that when we get to one of the books that actually has one of the passages about women, like First Timothy. Um, now, there is a little bit of a possibility in translation difference in verse 20. It says, for our citizenship is in heaven, it could also be our outpost. Uh, I'm sorry, um, how would you say this? Um... Instead of our citizenship of, um, is in heaven, it would be um, we are an outpost of heaven. I don't know exactly how you would say that off the top of my head. But he might be saying let, – let me just kind of clarify what that would mean. Basically, we are living in – when you know when when a army would conquer some places? They, they establish outposts yes. in a land that wasn't theirs. That's kind of the idea here. Okay. So he's either saying we exist as an outpost in this in this <laughs> in this land that is not ours, <laughs> uh, waiting for the savior, or he's saying um, we are citizens of, of of heaven. In which case, his focus is on the already nature of heaven. You know how I always talk about the already but not yet. We are saved, but we are being saved. Um, Jesus is king, but he will be king. The already but not yet nature of the gospel. That the, I, either way is doctrinally true. So it's not like I'm telling, teaching you false doctrines, but um, it's really an issue of translation. Mm -hmm. Our Savior has power to transform our body and subject all things. Now, look, notice what he says here. Who will transform the body? Okay, that's the resurrection of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So we're talking about that Jesus has the power. Okay, now that's important because that brings us to the question of that some people have asked, um, Jesus doesn't have the uh, have the uh, power to do it, to, to establish the kingdom and whatnot, and he is um, dependent on um, the Trinity. But that such an idea of separating the Trinity kind of misunderstands God as being one. So um, don't preach that too far. So then that takes us to verse one, where he says, "Now this is this trouble. This really bothered me for a while because I had no idea what he was talking." About. He says, "Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved." In what way, Paul? In what way? <laughs> well, if you look back, excuse me, and uh, he actually answers the question throughout chapter three by rejoicing. He mentions that in the beginning, right here, three one. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things again is no trouble and is a safeguard for you. By not accepting the teaching of the, of the Jews and the Judaizers, he talks about that in verses 3 through um, 9 and then picks it back up again in um, 17 through 19. So that's a big theme there. Um, and then uh, letting go of our titles, he talks about that. We already looked at in like verse um, 7 and 8. Uh, pressing on to the prize, you know, keep seeking after God. Uh, seek after God more today than you did yesterday, that kind of stuff. Uh, being conformed to his death, basically suffering for the sake of the gospel. Uh, living as Christians should 
And that brings us to the idea here that you can't really stand firm if we if you don't do those things. If you're not rejoicing, if you're um, if you are accepting the teachings of the Jews, uh, if you are uh, if you are not letting go of go of your glory, um, if you're not pressing on to, onto the prize of the glory, um, if you are um, not being conformed to Christ's death, if you are not living as Christians should, then you really can't stand firm. So what he's saying is, therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown. In this way, in this way, these things that I have said, in this way, stand firm. Uh, in the Lord, my beloved. And that ends that section there, um, which takes us into uh, verses 2 uh, through, I believe we're going to go through 3. Um, man, oh man, it's looking like maybe I just didn't hit the save button because there's supposed to be 3 at the top. Guys, this is really concerning me. Uh, I sure hope nothing nothing important is missing. <laughs> I mean, besides the question. <laughs> so, uh, here it says, I urge you, you Adair... Judea and I urge uh, um, Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Now, I think this is of utmost importance. He doesn't importance. He doesn't take sides. No, he's neutral. D did you see that? Yeah. He just said. He just told them, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm begging you guys get along. Right. Work out your differences and get along. Wow. Like he doesn't take a side in the issue at all. He doesn't even tell us what the issue is. Of course, why would he? He's writing to the Philippians. The issue is at the Philippian church. Right. Obviously, they know <laughs> that there's an issue. <laughs> um, okay, so then in verse 3, he says, Indeed, true companion. Now, who is the true companion? We don't know. He's referencing someone at the Philippian church that he doesn't call by name. He just calls him true or her. Doesn't really specify true companion. I ask you also to help these women, uh, Judea and Syntyche, uh, who have heard my... Her, who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. So we know that these two women are leaders of some sort. Right. Now, what kind of leaders are they in the church? We don't know because he doesn't really specify. He doesn't call them by a title. So that brings a few issues to light. First off, the issue of leadership fighting. Uh. Boy, if you want to not be a good example to the community... Have leaders that fight. That's the perfect way to not uh, to not be a, a good example. But then second off, it also brings another proof of women did have uh, leadership in early in early uh, church times. We see it in Romans. We see it here. We see it uh, in the Book of Judges. We see it all throughout history that, that women have had ro had roles in leadership. Um, and uh, why I'm advocating this so so. Steadfastly is because you have to realize, let's say half of the half of the Christian population is women. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're saying that women can't be in leadership of any kind, you're basically excluding 50 percent of of what you are right there, buddy. I saw it fling up into your eye. I was like, boy, that looked like it hurt. Um, chips are dangerous, guys. <laughs> um, it we're basically excluding 50 percent of the ministry workforce. 50 percent of the Christian voice, 50%. You see what I mean? That's yes. that's, that's not that's great. No. You're basically cutting the body of Christ in half. Yeah. And even though Christ said, hey, this is my body, you're saying, okay, I'm preferring this half of the body to this half of the body. <laughs> right. So I'm not saying about lawlessness. I'm not saying anything about family structures and those kinds of things. But I am saying that in the church, we, we do need to start reconciling this and seeing um, at, least, at least hearing women out more. Um, obviously, I'm not. I'm not telling you know Baptists, for instance, to change their entire church structure, or Methodists, or whatever. But there does need to be at least a little more dialogue on this issue. Um, right. People kind of come to their conclusions according to recent theology. Um, when you look at history, that theology didn't really exist, you know. And then they don't. They're not really willing to address the issue because no, that's just what our church believes in. It's like well. Maybe you shouldn't believe in that. I mean, right. if it's a doctrine that wasn't established by the early church and it was established after hundreds of years of power struggles in the church and after the corruption of the, of the Roman Catholic Church, maybe, just maybe, the doctrine should be looked at again. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't believe in going on crusades. No. The Roman no. Catholic Church did that. Right. So maybe we should reanalyze some of these views that have come up in more modern times. Right. Just, just something out there. Anyways, um, so uh, whoever these these women were, 
they um, it, the case can be made that they that they actually um, uh, did some traveling for Paul delivering letters. Um, we don't know for sure about that. It's just a case can be made, um, which I'm not going to waste the time here to do that. Um, that's one of those things that Nicole calls rabbit trails. <laughs> and then, um, and, but we do know that that they did some traveling with Paul and some ministry work with Paul. So he's he's appealing to some person there to help them to resolve their issues, um, some unnamed person. And okay, that ends up our section there. So we will pick up next week on on Philippians four and uh, four four. And we might end next week or the week after. I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet. Yeah. Depending. But we're going to end this sucker on a big bang. So um, don't miss the next two weeks. Because just don't. Okay. Unless they catch another strain of the flu. Unless you catch another strain of the flu. In which case, just sit over there. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, well, we'll strap you know that, that yellow caution tape around you. <laughs> Okay, so sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, sir. Uh, do, are there any questions about anything we talked about tonight? I had some, but I forgot them already. Well, if you do remember them, um, remember you can ask them anonymously, or you can write them down and ask them next week. So don't forget. Okay. Again. Okay. <laughs> like if you're in the shower crying, for instance, uh, dry your hands <laughs> off and write them down, and then go back to crying. I have plenty of time to rub it. Right. <laughs> I don't. You see my forehead alone, guys. Like, when will it end? When? Oh, there it is. Okay, I found the hairline. Then you go through, and it's like, wait, wait. Oh, oh my gosh, she's up. There's more here. Wow. And then it doesn't go back as far. What's going on? Uh, I'm just going right. <laughs> don't brag. Nobody likes a braggart. So okay, let's go ahead and end there. Uh, the riddle of the week, guys. Take off my skin. I won't cry, but you will. What am I? What the heck? <laughs> I think you know what it is. Well, you have all week to think about it. Remember, no Googling the answers. <laughs> no discussing it with people. Uh, no looking up the answers at all. Um, Anything you say can and will be used against you. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs>